Okay, so that should be recording now. So welcome everyone to panel two, which is on human and non-human kin. And we have four speakers, again with 10 minute presentations today, followed by a 30 minute Q&A session at the end. So do remember to pop in your questions into the chat and we will make sure to keep note of those and we'll facilitate that conversation at the end. So our first speaker today is Bryony Hughes. Bryony is an AHRC funded doctoral researcher and visiting tutor based at Royal Holloway University of London. She is interested in kinetic movement in language, water bodies, the archive and site specific writing. Bryony's publications include Dorothy, uh, published by Broken Sleep Books, and Microsporidial, published by Samson Lowe. And I have a copy of that here, in fact, with lovely, cute sized little pamphlets. She is founding member of the Crested Tick Collective and editor of Rewilding and Ecopoetic Anthology. Bryony recently also launched Osmosis, an independent press with a focus on writing that shifts and spills across boundaries. Bryony will be speaking today on Honey, her dwarf lock rabbit, and her poetic practice, I believe, in microsporidial. So over to you, Bryony. Hello, everybody. I'm Bryony. Just to describe myself, I am a white female in her 20s, mid 20s. Um, as Isabel mentioned, I have a background today. Um, it's essentially lots of little rabbits um, in various positions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Just bear with me. There we go. So I'm just going to begin today with a description taken from the British Rabbit Council Breed Standards. The dwarf lop is a small to medium sized rabbit weighing between four to 5.5 pounds. Dwarf lops have a short body and deep chest offering a cobby appearance. A good width between the eyes, full cheeks and a broad muzzle are desirable. A dwarf lop must not be long in body or have a narrow head. His ears must be fully lopped. This is honey. Honey the bunny was bred to be cute. Her desirable floppy ears and wide muzzle ensure that aesthetically, she is the ideal family pet. She is an incredibly soft, fluffy bundle of joy who pulls on everyone's heartstrings. However, her designed characteristics have led to numerous hospitalizations, a number of medical procedures, a major surgery and permanent disability. Yes, aesthetically, Honey was bred to be cute. Anatomically, Honey was bred to suffer for the aesthetic of cuteness. A human appreciation of cuteness and a resultant suffering go hand in hand. A Shaina guy asserts in our aesthetic commodity um, categories, when encountering a cute object, one may experience, quote, the desire to fondle and squeeze the object that cuteness similarly elicits, even to the point of crushing or seriously damaging the object, end quote. Like a child lovingly crushing the cultural phenomenon of the squishy beyond recognition, the human breeding of the wild European rabbit into its various domestic subspecies has led to irreversible harm. I'm just going to issue a content warning here. Um, there's a little bit of a graphic image of Honey after her surgery. When we adopted her, Honey's fully locked ears were home to two chronic ear infections. The infection had slowly been crushing and splintering the bones in her delicate ears. Her flat face comes with the price of a misaligned jaw meaning that bony spurs grow from her teeth and cut into the inside of her cheeks and tongue. In comparison, this is Bumble. Bumble is Honey's bonded partner and he is extremely healthy. His ears are proportionate and upright and unlike Cobby Honey, Bumble's body is angular and well-defined. When encountering the pair, friends and family reserve the adjective of cute for Honey and go on to describe Bumble as wild looking, beautiful, majestic, handsome or hair-like. However, Bumble's breed does not escape the violence of the aesthetic cuteness. Bumble is a Rex rabbit, meaning that due to genetic mutations, his coat lacks guard hairs and instead consists of plush or velvety dense fur. The Rex is bred for the fur farming industry to become a fashionable or to use the term colloquially cute accessory. The cuteness of both honey and Bumble is therefore tied up in ideas of aesthetic commodity. 
Rabbits Like Honey are marketed as, quote, cute, cuddly, fun and entertaining, end quote, family pets by national retail company Pets at Home, whilst publications such as Vogue have described fur and its faux counterparts as cute, chic fashion statements. Here, cute might be an antonym of wild. Honey's tiny, round, fluffy body positions her as worlds apart from her wild cousins. Behaviorally, wild instincts have been bred out of her. She has little fear of humans, enjoys a cuddle, is well litter trained, and loves nothing more than flopping onto the sofa in exposed spaces such as the living room sofa. Bumble, who alternatively displays incredibly complex rabbity behavior, doesn't quite fit the criteria for the fantasy of the unconditionally loving, easy to handle family pet, but can be rendered cute when, albeit violently, transformed into a soft, snuggly fashion accessory. To be cute is to be contained, controlled, domesticated, and translated into human commodity. Cute is therefore, as Nagai asserts, an aesthetic of powerlessness, or at least a power imbalance when in conjunction with the human. In terms of rabbits, cuteness can be gained through the loss of instinctual traits, independence, and an increased closeness or reliance on their human owners. Perhaps this may account for the popularity of the lop breed. To lop is, quote, to hang loosely or limply, to droop, to flop, or sway limply about, end quote. Characterized by limp ears, the lop rabbit embodies the desirable powerlessness of the cute aesthetic. In the introduction to our aesthetic categories, Nagai discusses the eroticization of powerlessness in relation to cuteness, stating that, quote, cute things evoke a desire in us not just to lovingly molest, but aggressively protect, end quote. I have been called out. Though I advocate against the breeding of rabbits and though I actively oppose the ownership of rabbits as an aesthetic commodity, my relationship with honey can definitely be categorized as one of fierce protection. With Nagai stating that cuteness, quote, in distress, end quote, is the most affecting cuteness, I'm stuck in a cycle of hypocrisy. When honey is vulnerable, when she is recovering from a procedure, when I wrap her up in a bunny burrito, to give her medicine, I experience an overwhelming inherent desire to hold, protect and mother her. I often fall into the habit of speaking to her in baby talk. I will call her my little baby and I'll make incoherent noises at her and I will speak with childish intonation, all whilst being aware that honey is 100% deaf. I'm painfully embarrassingly aware that this is entirely for my benefit. I'm sure that all honey experiences are my predator eyes locking onto her and my predator teeth gnashing about. I am, however, delighting in my encounter with her cuteness. And it is this human enjoyment of cute traits and aesthetics that has led to the suffering she is experiencing. So how do I work against this? I start with my living environment. In my octopus teacher, filmmaker Crave Foster emphasizes the role, the role shared, the <laughs> the role of shared surroundings of the South African kelp forest had in the development of his relationship with a wild octopus. He concludes the documentary by stating, quote, what she taught me was to fill your part of this place, not a visitor, end quote. Dwarf lop rabbits, unlike the common octopus, have never had a natural habitat. I'm in a reverse situation to foster, where my animal companion is occupying space within my human habitat. I do not want honey to feel like a visitor. My home is her home and I try to eliminate all necessary boundaries between my environment and hers. In the Companion Species Manifesto, Donna Haraway discusses the importance of, quote, sharing time, body and space, end quote, with animal companions. Since we adopted her, Honey has never lived in a hutch. During the day, she free roams in the house. She has full access to my living space. And during the pandemic, this is also my working space. She loves to chill out on the sofa and her play tunnels run under my coffee table. My cat, my, my flat, <laughs> sorry, is a co-species home. This is where my creative practice comes into play. In 2019, I was developing Mindfulness, an audiovisual poem series. When filming for one of the poems, I was exploring the violence of newsprint, tearing and collaging the metro on my living room floor. Honey took an interest in this activity and, due to the fact that she has access to my house, hopped over and began throwing and tearing the materials. In my octopus teacher, Craig Foster suggests that the nonverbal language of the octopus becomes visible through time spared in shared environments. Honey was very excited by the prospect of ripping up a newspaper 
and use the language available to her, digging, biting, sniffing, tooth grinding, ear pointing, throwing, chinning, nudging, to unintentionally contribute to my engagement with textual language. I was interested in including the footage of Honey's language and interactions with the page in the final iteration of the video. When Mindfulness One was published in Permeable Barrier, Honey was cited as a collaborator and her bio was listed too. I'm just going to read that out. Honey is a dwarf lot based in Briny and Laura's living room. She is currently interested in kale, hay, relaxing under the coffee table and pulling bits of paper out of the printer. She has previously been featured in a range of work, including batches by Laura Helen and performance work by Kat Chong. Her main poetic influence is Donna Haraway's dog. Though writing a bio for Honey was absolutely an exercise in silliness, it did raise several directions for a future writing practice. When Honey's illness first started manifesting in December 2019 through an E. caniculi infection, I began documenting it by drafting a small daily poem. At first, this was a way of coping, but it eventually developed into Micros Viridial, a chapbook published by Samson Lowe in 2020. I wanted to explore what it could mean to engage in a collaborative cross-species practice, writing through the intimacies between my body, Honey's body, and the body of the E. caniculi parasite. Microsporidial became an interaction with the language of Honey's body. By language, I'm not just referring to methods of communication, such as the movement of her ears and tooth grinding, but also the subtle ways in which her body communicates change and illness, such as small differences in her behavior and posture, the size of her droppings, the color of her urine, how she moves, her sense of balance, her rate of respiration, the temperature of ears and differences in eating habits, just to name a few. As rabbits are prey animals, they rarely display signs of pain to avoid communicating vulnerability to a predator. For both my writing practice and more importantly, the practice of caring for honey, I became entirely in tune with her body and its language. At the same time, I was living with chronic pain due to illnesses with my gallbladder and the resultant poems offered movements back and forth between my body and her own. I'm just gonna quickly read a couple. Nine gulps until reflex prevents further inhalation, feeling that rock in your neck, gaseous or remaining where your ear bubbles are, tickle the uvula, this chest is half full. Lip slick veid, sed uh, head tilted concerns or spores, the brain slight slipped into her periphery, slightly off balance, but not quite they lack from the same body. Bathing in an early hour until 111 suggests re entry, the womb, the gallbladder, these cells lifted beyond our exteriors. Red lights, the tree spurs, not essential, twitch that nose against plastic shapes, question these circles. Microsporidial was created in collaboration with artist Ellie Arden. Arden responded to the text for experimentations in ink markage, markings and spillages, capturing, as described by E.P. Jenkins, a transitory energy between health and illness, anxiety and meditation, partial and whole. But the microsporidial poem project does not escape the aesthetic of cuteness. A6 in size and described as a series of micro poems, the work can be positioned in relation to Nagai's consideration of smallness when reading the cuteness of avant-garde. Equally, the cute characteristics of Honey's cobby locked body retains a presence within the work. Nicholas Penny comments, you begin to recognize something at the very end, which is the twitching nose of the rabbit. And in the meantime, there has been lots of spores and cells and saliva and gums and tracks and trickles. The intentional inclusion of cute depictions of Honey alongside the horrendous manifestations of her illness helped me to cope. I worked with the publisher to establish the layout of the images and took comfort in ending the pamphlet with a recognizable illustration of Honey. It's clear that I'm in a complicated relationship with Honey's cuteness. I just want to end by letting you know that Honey has recovered from her surgery and is living a happy life with Bumble. We're supported by a fantastic team of vets who regularly more, um, monitor her physical health and general well-being and make sure that we're doing what's right for her. Um, if you have any questions, please do get in touch or ask them in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Bryony. And lovely to see those images as well. Um, yeah, thanks so much. And, and we'll look forward to any questions that come through. So our second speaker in panel two today is Dr. Catherine Lester. So uh, Catherine is a lecturer in film and television at the University of Birmingham. Her monograph, Horror Films for Children, Fear and Pleasure in American Cinema, 
will be published this year in autumn by Bloomsbury. She continues to explore the intersection between children's culture and the horror genre with recent and ongoing projects, including a forthcoming edited collection on Watership Down. And we're pleased to see this theme continued in her presentation today on Watership Down and the cultural faces of the rabbit. So hello, Kat, do you want to come and join us? Hi, thank you. Um, okay, I think I'm sharing my screen now. So hopefully you can see um, Fiverr in the field of blood. Um, I'll just start with um, a short self-description. I'm a white female in my early 30s. I use pronouns she, her. I have long brown hair, which because of uh, the pandemic hasn't been cut in a very long time. Um, and appropriate to my paper, I'm wearing a gray jumper with some um, embroidered white rabbits on it. And you might be able to see a small cuddly bunny friend in the corner of my screen as well. And before I begin, I also just want to issue a brief content warning for some potentially distressing images of rabbits. So, the horror scholar Peter Hutchings once declared in a throwaway remark that rabbits are just not that frightening. Hutchings was making a larger point about how some animals are more predisposed than others to being represented as monsters in horror films and for Hutchings, rabbits definitively do not make the grade. One has to wonder then if Hutchings had never seen or read Watership Down with its infamous representations of horror that is inflicted both by and towards rabbit characters. It is because of this violence that the 1978 film adaptation of Watership Down has a firm reputation as one of the scariest children's films ever made, a reputation that is represented and reinforced in online discourse, um, such as in memes, some of which you can see on the slide. While in the 1972 novel, by Richard Adams also bears some of this legacy, the animated film made the lengthy and wordy novel accessible to a wider and younger audience of children who might not have been prepared for the film's content. The perception of the film as a children's text is exacerbated by the fact that it is controversially rated U, the fact that it's animated, a form that carries heavy associations with child-friendly media, and of course that it's about bunnies. This child-friendly perception conflicts with the gory violence in the film itself. It is in large part because of this apparent incongruity of Watership Down's subject matter with its status as a children's cartoon about rabbits that it has retained a prominent place in British popular culture with the power to generate, head generate headlines and debate more than 40 years after its original release. As with the memes that you just saw, Journalists tend to describe the violence of Watership Down by pairing the word bunny, notably not rabbit, with terms like slaughter, blood and death in a deliberate juxtaposition of cuteness and horror. My presentation today is part of a larger project, which um, Izzy just mentioned, centering on examining the cultural imprint of Watership Down, specifically the 1978 film. Building on my existing work on horror in children's cinema, I'm interested in both Watership Down's reputation as one of the scariest children's films ever made, but also in drawing attention to the other interesting things about the text which are eclipsed by this reputation. Today's talk is a work in progress situated between both of these aims. Specifically, I'm interested in the way that media discourse around Watership Down constructs a binary of cuteness and horror with little room for nuance or complexity. This opposition is a crucial part of Watership Down's ongoing legacy and as evident from some of the memes I just showed, it's an opposition which fans obviously derive a great deal of humour from, as well as possible catharsis from the acknowledgement of a shared experience of childhood trauma. But I argue that this process also does a great disservice to the text itself, to its child audiences and most of all to rabbits. We're just not used to seeing rabbits that look and act like they do in Watership Down. Rabbits, perhaps more than any other animal, epitomise not horror, but cuteness. 
The cute, fluffy or playful bunny is arguably the dominant image of the rabbit in popular visual culture, whether in characters like Bambi Stumper or Beatrix Potter's Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail and Peter. Rabbit characters are often animated and the additional freedoms that this medium poses for the exaggeration and anthropomorphization of the animal body means that the features of animated rabbits can be enhanced for added cuteness. In some cases, they are even given anatomically incorrect embellishments in the service of this goal, such as the addition of pads, also nicknamed toe beans, on their feet, which you can see um, with Thumper. The Netflix film Over the Moon, which you can see pictured on the right, is perhaps the most egregious example of this strategy to over the rabbit body with aforementioned toe beans, as well as eyelashes and curves. This is a process that plays into what Randy Malamud describes as the human gaze, where the animals we gaze upon in film are prized for their cuteness in a way that is feminized and derogatorily so. Cute animals are like dumb blondes. This feminization, as I think has already been alluded to by some of the papers today, can also overlap with infantilization, where rabbits are equated with children and turned into ultimate helpless victims, whether the bunny boiler scene in Fatal Attraction, the rabbit massacre in Rules of the Game, in which real rabbits were killed in service of the film, or more recently in The Favourite. These examples are all the more shocking because the violent context content is inflicted upon helpless little bunny rabbits as stand-ins for innocent children. It is precisely because of this cultural construction of the rabbit as cute, innocent and childlike that they are also sometimes represented as frightening. Whether for humorous purposes, as with the killer rabbit in Monty Python, which is where the title of my paper comes from, Anya's fear of rabbits in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, but rabbits are also used to genuinely chilling effect in films like Us and Donnie Darko. But here, the assumption of cuteness is still paramount because it needs to be subverted and made frightening. The popular discourse around Watership Down would have us believe that it fits neatly within these categories of horrific and victimized rabbits. But rabbits, both in reality and, in, and as represented in Watership Down, are much more complex than their stereotyped representations imply. This is neatly demonstrated by this character sheet that was used in the production of the film. It's clear from this that the animators went to great lengths to give all of the rabbit characters distinguishing physical features and personality traits, including clever, crafty, impulsive, nervous, strong, kind-hearted. And yes, some of the rabbits are cute and some of them are violent. Anyone who has had a pet rabbit will probably know that this variety of traits is fairly representative of actual rabbits. In the film itself, the rabbits are anthropomorphized, but in their body language, movement and overall appearance, they still hew much closer to realism than most other animated rabbit characters. In other words, what is interesting about Watership Down is that it rejects the binary image of the rabbit as straightforwardly cute or unexpectedly terrifying, presenting perhaps one of the most nuanced representations of rabbits in popular culture. So why then, is this complexity elided in favor of the shock value of, ah, scary rabbits? And I believe the answer lies primarily in the way that rabbits tend to be equated with children. Within film, and especially in the horror genre, children, like rabbits, tend to fall into binary categories of villain and victim. In both cases, cuteness is of utmost importance, where child victims, for example, in Poltergeist, uphold cuteness and villains, whether in The Omen or uh, Village of the Damned, subvert it. Crucially, cuteness in both rabbits and children is a quality that can easily become unsettling. This is referred to by um, director Jordan Peele. Um, speaking about the use of rabbits in his film Us, he said that rabbits might look cute and fluffy on the surface, but in their eyes, he finds to have a terrifying blankness. This is what also makes children in horror films like Village of the Damned so unsettling. And nowhere is this uncanny slippage more uh, between cute and frightening more evident than in this disconcerting photo of Shirley Temple with a rabbit companion. 
If rabbits in, in film are often shaped to fit a restrictive human gaze, then children are subjected to an adult gaze that expects them to conform to normative expectations of childhood passivity, innocence and subservience to adults. To paraphrase Robin Wood's seminal theory of the horror genre, child villains who defy these expectations must either be saved or killed by an adult representative of the status quo to restore the adult child hierarchy. In this framework, there is little room for children who occupy an in-between space, children who can be active, autonomous, and even violent without being automatically villainized. If we read rabbits as child substitutes, I think this goes some way to explaining the way that discourses around Watership Down distill the film's reputation into images of rabbits as either victims or perpetrators of violence. The film itself, as I explained earlier, allows its rabbits to be varied and complex and refuses to confine them into the narrow categories of victim and villain that are demanded by the adult human gaze. And I think that this um, poster for the film alludes to that complexity. So if this isn't carried out, this process of binary categorization isn't carried out by the film, we can see it carried out instead in the media discourse and audience responses to the film. As the film is widely perceived to be a children's film, we can see the adult constructed fear both of and for the rabbit as also a concern for and fear of children. This echoes numerous overblown and unsubstantiated moral panics about children's exposure to violent media that has proliferated for decades. Again, these concerns come back to cuteness, where the worry is that children's innocence and naivety will be corrupted, and at worst, that actual child audiences might become violent themselves. In relation to Watership Down, then, the, fray, the, the familiar refrain, won't somebody please think of the children, also becomes, won't somebody please think of the bunnies? But as I have explained elsewhere, these kinds of fears about children's exposure to violent content treat children as a homogenized group with no variation in age, taste, emotional maturity or tolerance for fear. Studies on children as viewers of horror reveal them to be remarkably sophisticated when it comes to managing their own fearful responses to media. Similarly, when we look at Watership Down, we can see that its rabbit child protagonists are represented as highly capable, while a majority of the violence is actually committed by humans, other animals, or the film's rabbit villain, the fascistic General Woundwort. When it comes to violence and horror in Watership Down then, it actually falls along very moral lines that hew quite closely to dominant expectations of children's fiction. In conclusion, cuteness and the way that this conflicts with horror is crucial to the way that audiences continue to engage with and derive enjoyment from Watership Down. And we could see this neatly illustrated again in responses to the 2018 computer animated remake. With this, audiences and critics reacted to it in horror, but not because of the violent content. Instead, it was because the aesthetic of the computerized rabbits was deemed ugly or perhaps not cute enough. But let us not forget that Watership Down, rabbits and children all have a lot more to offer than the surface appearances might imply. But with that said, I couldn't resist ending with a picture of my own rabbits at their peak cuteness. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kat. And could we find out what their names are, your, your rabbits? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, this one, um, the, the one slightly higher is Gizmo, and the other one is Hazel, named after one of the rabbits in Watership Down. Oh, thank you so much, Kat. <laughs> Excellent. So today's panel, panel two, can in some ways be split into, into two in the sense that we have two presentations on rabbits and now we have two presentations coming up on moomins or related to moomins. So I'll now introduce our third speaker, Sarah Cave, who is a writer, academic and editor living in Cornwall where she runs Guillemot or co-runs Guillemot Press, as well as working towards a practice-based PhD at Royal Holloway University of London. She has published four pamphlets, two collections, and a co-authored collection of poems, as well as contributing to numerous journals, magazines, and anthologies. 
Sarah is currently working on her third full length solo authored collection, as well as a monograph on the poetics of prayer and contemporary poetry. In 2020, she was long listed for the Women Poets Prize and the title of her talk today is All Her Process Lost, The Death of Moomin Mama and the Cuteness of Grief. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Izzy. I'll just, uh, I'll just begin by, by saying a big thank you to uh, Izzy and Caroline for organizing this amazing event. It's been really lovely so far. I'll also give a brief description of myself. Um, which is a strange thing to do, but um, I, I will do so anyway. I've got uh, long red hair tied up, uh, white skin, blue eyes, pink glasses. I'm wearing Gigi earrings from Kiki, uh, Kiki's delivery service. There's a, a pink monkey behind me. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably enough, isn't it? I also have my uh, Milia with me. Uh, I don't know if you can see my snapper called Puffin. Um, yeah, so I'll just share my screen. Hang on. <laughs> can I just check that uh, you can all hear me properly as well? Yes, you're coming across really well. Good. I live in Cornwall where the, where the Wi-Fi is awful. Um, so I'm just checking. Share screen. There we go. Okay. Uh, so in 2016, I began to write poems as a way of reading Turvey Janssen's Moomin Troll series. Little did I know I was writing toward a tragedy that would leave Moomin Valley shattered and devastated like no comet or flood ever could. In 2018, Guillemot Press published the obituary. Moomin Mama was dead. The fragments of her life left behind, curated between pink and black covers. Life is fragile. Life can be shattered as quickly and mercilessly as clay vessels. And as the second book of Corinthians declares, we ourselves are like fragile clay. And thus, like fragile clay came to be like a broken vessel, a broken valley, one that Moomin Mama is both absent from and still colourfully animating. For anyone who doesn't know Moomin Mama or her significance to the characters in Janssen's canon, she is the matriarchal figure of a chaotic but loving extended family. Moomin Mama enjoys knitting, making jam, gardening and collecting shells. She epitomizes everything that is warm, comfortable, loving, and cute about Moomin Valley. But every now and again, even she needs to escape. Many people have their own Moomin Mama, alive or dead. Janssen's Moomin Mama was her own mother, Sinye Hamastan Janssen, who she also immortalized as the grandmother in her summer book. Mine was my grandmother, who died in 1992 and like fragile clay is dedicated to. I didn't want to write a book about my grandmother though. I wanted to write a book about grief, one that would appeal to others, but not in the abstract, not in the manner that Douglas Gresham in his introduction to C.S. Lewis's The Grief Observed describes as so general and non-specific as to be academic in its approach and thus of little movement. A grief observed is an extrication of Lewis's grief for his wife, Joy, Gresham's mother, who died of cancer. As a confessional work, a grief observed works towards a personal sense of catharsis for Lewis. Catharsis was not what I wanted from like fragile clay. I wanted to construct a text that concealed me. I wanted to write about grief through something more universal and yet still personal, through a shared set of effects or cultural reference points with identifiable characters in a familiar landscape. The familiarity of the Moomin characters and their already established cuteness disseminated through publishing houses, television companies, and toy manufacturers means that their form 
and the memories of the comfort and delight those forms bring creates a space in which cuteness exists and therefore can be disrupted. I wanted to use the reader's familiarity with the characters and the text to turn the world on its head and disrupt the idyllic paradigm of childhood with the unsettling emotions of adulthood. My intention, perhaps to question the enclosure of childhood as a safe space. In Like Fragile Clay, what was once pleasure becomes grief with all its associative emotions, such as loss, terror, and fear. There is no going back to Moomin Valley, which has shifted, altered, was never fully re realized in the first place and only ever perceived in fragments. Moomin Mama and Moomin Valley are cast in an eternal state of grace that they neither deserve nor desire. In A Grief Observed, Lewis writes, Maudlin tears, I almost prefer the moments of agony. These are at least clean and honest, but the bath of self-pity, the wallow, the loathsome, sticky, sweet pleasure of indulging it, that disgusts me. Give that mood its head, and in a few minutes, I shall have substituted for the real woman, a mere doll, to be blubbered over. In Like Fragile Clay, we find the bereaved Lewis deriding himself for reducing his dead wife to a mere doll just after a poem called Untitled Elemental, in which Moomin, Moomin Mama's son, contemplates artifacts from his mother's life. In the poem, Moomin holds the loo of his mother and feels the absence of her and the mother doll they once called until. Moomin Mama is the breeze, her glasses, floral headband, Moomin keeps her apron string striped like candy. How he wanted her, longed for her, her name in gold foil, a solitary noun, no verb, encased, all her process lost. In the quote, Lewis is worried about the nature of his remembrance and views the relief he experiences from blubbering over joy as the reduction of who she was, a theft of her personhood. And yet, how else can grief be relieved? Gresham describes Lewis as a man emotionally naked in his own Gethsemane. Bit over the top, but perhaps so. And perhaps the image of the martyred Christ is in some way significant to the absent Moomin Mama. Christianity in perhaps another awestruck paper might be understood to be a cult of grief, agonizing over the cuteness of the death of Christ, a cuteness that neither lessens the sacrifice nor the tragedy. Give that mood its head, and in a few minutes, I shall have substituted for the real woman, a mere doll or a mere icon to be blubbered over. In the 1996 forward to A Brief Observed, Madeline Lengel, the children's writer, writes that C.S. Lewis and I share the fear of the loss of memory. No photograph can truly recall the beloved smile. Occasionally, a glimpse of someone walking down the street someone alive, moving in action, will hit with a pang of genuine recollection. But our memories, precious though they are, still are like sieves, and the memories inevitably leak through. Lewis is concerned with remembering joy as she was but glum, as she was, but glumly acknowledges the impossibility of doing so. He writes, slowly, quietly, like snowflakes that come when it is going to snow all night, little flakes of me, my impressions, my selections are settling down on the image of her. Should Moomin Mama be blubbered over, reduced to the cuteness of a mere doll? Is catharsis worth erasure or is catharsis setting the ground for recollection? Is Moomin Mama no more 
than her red and white striped apron, preserved like a saint's mantle in a glass box. Was that all she ever was, even when she was alive? When besieged by the cuteness of grief, are Moomin Mama's personal effects the only material substances to conjure her back into the world? To necromance the dead into shadows, if only for the briefness of an afternoon, afternoon's weeping, or 40 days of relief? Or should the dead be left to their peace? Widower's Walk. Scotch on the rocks, says Moomin Papa. It's the only way to live. Abstinence bit his lip. A whiskey bottle lighthouse, the lantern room uncorked. Salt sea winds. He sits, cupped beneath the cupola, his life held in the swinging of the bottle, the tune, the dance, the memory of home. Moomin Valley, quiet now. Moon slit, distant light. Solitary Moomin Papa looks across the sea to where a hurricane lamp flickers and two tickies silhouette moving in the bathhouse window is reflected on the water. Her light extinguished. Moomin Papa shudders, the groak, his longing for comfort, the warmth of the hearth always, unknown. Pitchers fall to the floor, a jar of earth smashes. Moomin Papa fumbles for the crossword. Moomin gone, four down. My abroad, six across. Snufkin left last year, his cork still bobbing, his row half done, nomad, other synonym. Moomin Mama is now only an echo, no arbor for having tea, no herbaceous border, just rock and horizon, rock and horizon. Her skin still rough like a conch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a beautiful reading from Like Fragile Clay. I'm uh, really, really pleased to hear those poems. So our fourth speaker today is Maria Darwish. And Maria Darwish is a PhD candidate in Gender Studies at Orobro University. I may have mispronounced that, so Maria, feel free to say it again for us when you come in. In her PhD thesis, Maria investigates eco-fascism's relationship to gender, love, and nature. She holds a master's degree in Gender Studies from the University of Oslo, and her MA thesis dealt with the intersection of far-right extremism, environmentalism, and masculinity. Her research interests include neo-Nazism, racism, fascism, ideology, critical animal studies, affect, human ecology, and human nature issues such as veganism and climate change. And today we'll be hearing from Maria on cuteness in eco-fascist propaganda. So over to you, Maria. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, yes, okay. Uh, Isabel, can you, can you say something? Because I couldn't hear you earlier. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Darwish. I'm a first year PhD candidate in gender studies at Örebro University in, in Sweden. Um, my, my self ID, I am a Norwegian Egyptian woman with curly hair. I am sitting in my office. I am 30 years old and I'm wearing black clothes and black headphones. Sure. Okay. 
Okay, let me know if uh, I think it should be okay. I think you should see my presentation now. So first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, there's such good vibes in the seminar. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really, really cool to be able to present at uh, such a, yeah, a seminar with such pleasant topics, more pleasant than what I usually um, deal with in my work, for sure. I focus on what is called ecofascism, which can be understood as the marriage between the far right and environmentalism, largely stemming from German and Nazism. The idea of ecofascism has become more prevalent the last years due to the 2019 shootings in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, uh, in El Paso, Texas, and in Badum, Norway in which the white supremacist culprits held an uh, eco-fascist ideological motive. So there are some contestations around the term of eco-fascism, but for now it will suffice to say that eco-fascism is about reviving an organic racial community of expelling all uh, intruders, uh, in quotation marks. It's about separatism and uh, a brutally ahistorical and just solution or solutions uh, to the pending climate crisis, which privileges a white global north. So that's the, that's the short version. And you can, yeah, you can see, oh, okay, it ended up like this. You can see more here. This is um, some recommended literature for those who might be interested. So uh, a content warning, uh, I, I will present my essay on cuteness in eco-fascist propaganda. And I hereby warn you of the racist and anti-Semitic content that follows. And there is especially one meme, which is violently anti-Semitic, and I thought to emphasize this considering the tense situation in Palestine and Israel at the moment. Uh, but after deliberating with our hosts, I ha however chose to include this meme because the far right internet is rife with such content and I think we must face it to understand it and to be able to fight the ideology that is spread through such uh, imaginaries. But I will, I will announce it again before I display this particular meme. So um, I'm, I'm very new to the field of cuteness. Uh, I came uh, into this field by pondering on the peculiarity of the visual material that I found in open eco-fascist social media groups. Uh, there were photos of Hitler hand feeding deer, cuddling up with dogs, masked militias posing with fluffy bunnies, women with small children or animals in epic nature, and even hyaline kittens. And I saw, I saw some kind of appeal to positive effect in the viewer. And when I, when I was suggested by my supervisor to read up on cuteness, I recognized how these images combined the violent with the cute, the forbidden with the fluffy, um, Cute became a way to soften and make Nazism, far-right extremism, fascism uh, more palatable. But a particular set of images stole my attention again and again, namely the Moomin memes. The Moomins um, are, as you know by now, um, a family of very cute white round trolls set in the enchanted universe, drawn by the Swedish-Finnish author Tove Jansson. Many Nordic, Nordic people have fun childish mem uh, childhood memories of the Moomins, and as a Norwegian millennial myself, the Moomins followed me through adolescence, and I turned to the comforting um, Moomin cartoons well into my teens when I was uh, home sick from school. Experiencing such loving orientations towards these figures, I was quite shocked to find images of the Moomins presented alongside racist symbols and violent content. The Moomins lead simple lives in the peaceful pastoral and lush Moomin Valley and uh, are therefore well suited to represent naive nature romanticism in ecofascist imaginaries. Generally, though, the ecofascist propaganda is either blatantly violent and militant or romanticizing nature, women and animals. So I find that the Moomin memes blur these two categories somewhat which I will demonstrate through the following meme. So now uh, the following meme is the one with um, the content warning. 
So here you see a meme of the Moomin family clad in skull masks, carrying bloody weapons, the text reading on our way to the synagogue. What function does this brutally anti-Semitic meme serve? So this meme demonstrates a transgressive appeal where childlike and nostalgic Im imaginaries are mixed with terror ideology. By appropriating a familiar cartoon, uh, in the Nordic context, uh, context anyway, the Moomins are extremely familiar, the meme evokes an effective response to cute. But the image is bizarre and confounding. The blatant anti-Semitism presented alongside the Moomins is totally absurd and uh, surprising. This preposterous display is intended to invite uh, a humorous response. Such are the workings of transgressive far-right memes, like, for example, Pepe the Frog, that you might know. Um, this figure has also been appropriated from an innocent uh, cartoon and is particularly popular in the US far-right scene, but has spread globally, um, to, uh, like among transnational far-right uh, environments. So, and, and the memes with Pepe the Frog also mix cartoons, humor, uh, irony, and uh, violence. Conversely, the Moomin memes are deeply ambiguous. They present the viewer with conflicting messages. Cute and familiar cartoons meet the grotesque and forbidden Nazi symbols. In the Moomin universe, however, a line is rarely drawn uh, between the good and the bad. Consider the Grok, for example. The Grok is a ghost-like, hill-shaped, ice creature with glaring eyes, freezing everything in her way. She's a constant lurking source of terror for the Moomins, and she surely was for me as well, as a child, that is. But, but the Grok is sad and lonely. She's desperately longing for contact. She cannot get close to anyone without hurting them. So contrary to her dreadful first impression, she does not represent the evil forces as perhaps is expected in typical Manichaean cartoon fashion, where the world is divided between separate domains of good and evil. By constructing complex characters, Janssen perhaps wants to remind us that the force of good resides in all beings. My, so my, my point of discussing the good and the bad in the Moomin universe is that this inviting warmth uh, um, the, yeah, the inviting warmth of these cartoons strengthen the appeal and the effect uh, of these memes. Additionally, a divide between the good and the bad can be drawn by using cute imaginaries, and then fascists, eco-fascists can fortify a belief that they are fighting the good cause against the wretched other. So Simon May shows how appealing to cute extends our circle of sympathy for the other and consequently then widen our circle of morality. So the ambiguous unit of cute and far-right imaginaries invites sympathy with far-right ideas and intends to legitimatize fascist culture as morally and politically justifiable. So presenting eco-fascist messages via Moomin memes serves to diffuse violent, uh, racist, and uh, Nazi content. It is, however, deeply disturbing that the Moomins are appropriated for such vile purposes. Uh, Tove Jansson was a committed anti-Nazi activist during the Second uh, World War, and I'm sure she would be appalled and horrified if she knew, if she could see how our wonderful Moomin universe is abused by neo-Nazis today. And here is a uh, some of the cover art that she made for the Swedish anti-fascist magazine Garm in the 1940s. So yeah, this is all I all I had. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for those those content warnings as well. I think that was very sensitively done. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists for panel two. What an incredible range of talks! So informative. Um, thanks, Maria, Bryony, Sarah, and Kat. Um, very happy now to open the floor to questions, and uh, you're welcome to pop these in the chat. You're welcome to raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question in person. Um, there's lots in the chat already. Uh, 
with parallels and other people's research from Elena. Um, Mag's particularly interesting, and I agree with everything Susie's saying. Very thought-provoking perspectives on, on rabbits and on moomins. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to start with? If not, I might ask one. <laughs> Elena, do you want to come in? <laughs> Sorry, I was <laughs> I was trying to raise my hand, but I, I couldn't figure out how to hit the button. Um, thank you all for your talks. I can't kind of came in um, in the middle here. So I'm gonna ask um, Maria talks. This is most fresh in my mind. I just finished writing a paper about anti uh, Indiana Jones being used as an anti-fascist icon um, in memes. So sort of you know, images of Indy punching Nazis um, and uh, the, is it okay to punch a Nazi um, meme? And then leading to the answer, yes, it is. But I was wondering if um, in your research where you were looking at these sort of memes online, like were you going into uh, 4chan and some of these other um, uh, online communities, subreddits and so forth that, that sort of, where did you find your memes? To, uh, to, so, to sort of analyze, because I found having to go into those kind of places really a bit disgusting, but nevertheless, like that's where we had to find our research was to kind of like look, look in where they were sourced, which is usually 4chan and subreddits. Should I answer now as well? Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, so, Yes, I, I find 4chan especially really, really vile. And so I, I, I don't go in there to look for memes. I have found, and I'm, I just started this. Uh, I haven't really like gotten in deep because I think for my further research, I need to find more material. Um, but I'm, I use Telegram a lot. Uh, there are some specific groups for ecofascism in there and they they post a lot of this like more more aesthetic like you know it's, it's still violent and terrible but but um most of it is actually like more palatable in a way and it's like um it's easier to to digest than more of the um, yeah grueling things i see on 4chan and so on and and i i don't think that my that what i'm looking for will be found on on 4chan, but it might be. And so I might go back in there, not, not really looking forward to that. Um, also, I do find some of my material from the Nordic neo-Nazi groups that I that I look at, Nordic resistance movement. They post also a lot of memes and so on. But the, these Moomin memes are especially from these Telegram groups. Right, okay. For, for us, it was always Reddit because you could, mm. you could actually go back in history. I mean, the problem with 4chan is that it kind of disappears after a while. So unless you're sort of watching it as it roll, unrolls in real time and collecting things, it's, it's difficult to do that. But but Reddit might be a good source if you haven't already kind of delved in. I'm not exactly sure if there's a slash eco fascist, fascist subreddit because it would have to be phrased in such a way to kind of you know sound like it wasn't that. But uh, there there probably Thank you. is. Mm -hmm. I will I will definitely check that out. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Elena and Maria. So we have a question uh, from Steve Wiley, who's posting under the name of Some Art in the chat. Um, I'm going to take the second uh, comment that you put into the chat, Steve. So how could this eco poetics be teased apart, resist or not fall foul of or not be overly vulnerable to the eco-fascism delineated in Maria's paper? I want to sympathise with Honey, the rabbit, but not with fascists. In Watership Down, it is the extreme of vision, sorry, it is the vision of fields filled with blood of extreme violence and loss that spur the rabbits on their journey, I think, although I can't really remember, the film was too scary. <laughs> um, so there's kind of a question here, I think around, and this is a question actually I, I was going to potentially ask around, you know, what we can do in, in some of these representations of cuteness that might in some way, um, I don't know, redeem the wonder or, or kind of um, the wonder of the cute or reclaim something of, of cuteness and wonder because I know that in that Pepe the Frog um, description um, or controversy that came about the designer of that image was very much involved in trying to then reclaim Pepe the Frog as an anti-fascist 
figure. Um, so I'm just wondering if anyone has any, anyone from the panel would like to uh, respond to some of these comments by Steve. Sarah, do you want to come in? I just thought, I wonder if there's something in both Kat and Maria's papers. I mean, both mentioned nuance. Uh, the nuance of the Moomin world is, is so much more than these memes are giving over. Um, there's like a, like the warmth draws everybody in, but it doesn't, the, the natural conclusion is not eco-fascism. It's, it's something else, I don't know. And then also worship down, like it's a, such a nuanced space requiring different uh, quite adult emotions and and I think in like fragile clay the adult emotions are also in moments as well that that are, are blending and and maybe there's something about nuance and and cuteness uh that's lost in the the, the eco-fascist memes anyway so that's just a thought I just had sorry <laughs> Sarah. And just as you're saying that, I'm picking up on the end of, of Steve's previous comment about um, ethical commitments. So, um, you know, I wonder if that might be a, a fruitful route to go down. I wonder how do we bring the ecological more squarely back into this? Is it also through grief? What might the ethical commitments be of an eco-poetics informed by or centred in cuteness? So I think, I think that's quite an interesting way of perhaps... Um, finding an intersection between the cute and the playful, but also the, the serious, which I think, I mean, Bryony, I don't know if this would be something you could talk to, given that there feels almost at times to be a kind of activist project, you know, in, in the work that you're producing with Honey. I think that's a really interesting question and so complicated. I feel like with, with Honey in particular, we adopted her um, from somebody who was really mistreating her. And I, whenever I am publicly um, putting content about honey, maybe on social media, for example, I make sure that I'm trying to educate people on maybe how rabbits should be treated. I think in terms of honey's illness, there's that really strange and fine line between cuteness and horror and the, my, how complicit I am in that, in the fact that when she was very, very poorly, um, she had an awful head tilt that led to her flipping uncontrollably. And it was, it was like she was possessed, it was horrifying, it was incredibly distressing as well. Um, and I feel like these things aren't explored per se within the context of the, the cute bunny rabbit that's in the home. Um, you, you usually don't associate that with the pet rabbit. Um, and I guess what I was trying to do with microsporidial um, is Add, like join up those dots a little bit and explore the different sides of looking after and living alongside um, a little bunny <laughs> and that it's not always cute it can be very distressing and upsetting. Mm. And, and Kat I just wonder if, if we could bring you in because obviously at the end of, of your paper you brought up you know this revised version of Watership Down which still wasn't um, finding, I suppose, an audience that was happy with this representation of rabbits because they're too ugly because of the animation. I mean, is there a, a way that we should be seeing rabbits? What can we do? And I, you know, I don't know if that's a question you want to answer, if you'd like to kind of answer the questions that we've already been posing. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure if I, my thoughts are very coherent, but um, I think um, one of the things I haven't really, I didn't really mention in my paper was um, the way that I think it's interesting that, that grief has come up a lot so far in this panel. And um, something I didn't really mention was the, the fact that when people talk about Watership Down, one of the reasons it tends to be remembered as traumatic is not just because of the, the sort of horror and gory violence, but it's also remembered as very tremendously sad. Um, and I wonder if that does relate to the themes of sort of eco-fascism um, that have come up as well, the way that um, the text does seem to want to um, evoke these emotions, whether it's sadness or, or being frightened um, toward a political end, one which is about um, reckoning with the human destruction of the environment. And um, uh, Steve, you you are absolutely correct that it is the the field the fields filled with blood which spurs them in the first place. Um, Fiverr the rabbit has a, a vision of the field being covered with blood, 
So I'm not really sure what to make of these connections, but there is definitely something there between um, the environmental message and the uses of grief um, and, and violence in all versions of the text. With regards to the, the CG adaptation, um, it didn't really occur to me until writing this paper actually that part of the, res the, the negative response to the aesthetic of the, the adaptation might have been partly to do with the rabbits aren't cute enough. I think it was also just a sense of this just doesn't look as, as high level and uh, as, as high quality as we would expect from say a Pixar animated film. But I do wonder if, again, it's that kind of the lack of Disneyfication, both in the overall quality, but also perhaps in the look of the rabbits themselves, um, which, which is part of the reason it was responded to in that way. You know, if you have to watch something that is terribly sad and horrific, you know, you may as well be looking at something that's kind of cute at the same time, I suppose. You know, what's what otherwise what's in it for the uh, <laughs> for the for the human viewer with, you know, the human gaze. Right. So, yeah, bringing us back to those questions about cuteness and, and pleasure, maybe. Sarah, do you want to come in? I just ask, I, I, because I, as a child, I was a massive fan of Warship Down. I loved it and we watched it repeatedly. Um, my sister's grown up to to hate it and she won't let her daughter watch it but I love it and I still love it and I think it taught me how to feel in a in a way um, and I'm just I'm just wondering whether after after hearing you talk Kat whether there's something about the hand-drawn nature of the original that maybe has has something over the CGI and I wonder if if I, I just wondered what your opinion of that was. Yeah, I definitely think there's probably something there with regards to um, uh, the lamenting of hand-drawn animation as a kind of dying art that we that we don't tend to see anymore. And certainly, the seventy-eight Watership Down is beautiful um, and a kind of landmark, especially in British animation. Um, so I definitely there's there's something there as well in just the um, the lack of aesthetic beauty that is perceived in CG as a whole, which I think is unfair to a lot of really good CG animation, but certainly with the Watership Down adaptation, it was, um, it fell short of people's expectations. There, were, there was also that massive um, resistance to the Ghibli film recently as well, wasn't there? The, the Ghibli appeal of the hand-drawn animation and then suddenly there's a CGI version, no one will go and see it. <laughs> Definitely. I wonder, I wonder if it's um, part of the, the reason that people like latch on to cell animated hand-drawn animation is because not just it's perceived as having a particular quality that's perceived as very beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, but also because it is hand-drawn, it implies an intimacy that you don't get through the computer animation, um, maybe that's got something to do with it as well. Great. We have time for a couple more questions and I can see in the chat we have one from Charlie who says, do you think that the aspects of body horror that we ignore in selective breeding, so easily hidden by their cuteness, ties into the way these memes hid moral horrors behind cuteness? So this might be a question for kind of between Maria and Bryony perhaps. I think that's such an interesting question, mainly because it, it bridges that gap between my presentation and Maria's. I think that I, I, I've particularly found, especially when reading texts on cute studies, which isn't my field of expertise, that there's that fine line between the cute and the horrifying. And it's almost as if that, that little point where it flickers is where cuteness is almost the most compelling. Um, so, for example, the the reference to honey being in distress, being something that might be considered cute, and that is incredibly problematic as well. Um, but I feel like there's something a little bit different when it comes to these memes, but maybe for those with that kind of political agenda, I don't know if that is what is compelling. I'm not so sure. Maria, do you want to jump in here? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. This um... <clears throat> that there's a fine line between the cute and the horrifying and that it's at its most, com most compelling when you're touching on this line. Um, so I, I don't have a specific comment for, for the question, but I like it just keeps coming back to me. Um, I, and I can't remember where I read it, but 
I mean, so I, or my interpretation of the workings of these memes is, uh, is also that, um, that the fascists, the eco-fascists are boosting their own morality, constructing themselves as, as good, as like the, the, the good ones in opposition to the evil ones by, um, by using animal uh, imaginaries and cute imaginaries. So, I mean, it's like a, it's, it's an instrumental use, it's flattening. Uh, it's, it's only a certain dimension of cute or of morality that is actually being, being played. So, I mean, and, and I, I mean, I, I thought ecofascism was uh, somewhat like that it went deeper and in, on some levels it does because Nazism is connected, like deeply connected to certain green ideas and ideas of ecology, but it's, it's not really ecology. Uh, definitely not. And so, uh, yeah, my, my answer is just that uh, it's, it's all, it's all very shallow. Yeah. Shallow use. Mm. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I think we'll probably have to draw things to a bit of a close, but I do just want to mention that there are some really interesting comments in the chat here thinking about disability and cuteness and cuteness, you know, we go right back to thinking about Hello Kitty and her lack of mouth. Um, we might kind of think about disability um, as well. So um, do have a read of those comments in the chat and I think they may well come up in our discussions later on. Perhaps we can keep an eye on that and, and kind of try and tie them all up later. So we're now going to break for lunch. So thank you again to our four panelists for a fantastic conversation and to our questions as well. Those questions have definitely led us into some interesting places. We're going to break for lunch and we're going to have a film screening that will bring us back to the seminar. And that will be at, let me just remember where am I, <laughs> where my timetable is. So that will be at uh, 1.40 and we'll have Charlene Teo's brilliant essential animal. So please do come back for 1.40. I'm going to stop recording now and I'll put up the Menti uh, word cloud and you're very welcome to keep contributing. So thanks again to our panelists and have a lovely lunch.